just to call the worship real quick, and then we will have the baptism of the follow. I believe it's one of the processes going to be, so we can turn to join in. Real quick, we'll place here. Second Corinthians 317. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Everybody bow. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day, dear Lord, even aside from the rain, dear God, we all know we need the rain, dear Lord. Dear Lord, just please be with us and guide us through this ceremony as we watch a baptismal, dear Lord. Just let us know the reasons behind it, dear God. Just please be with us and guide us throughout the rest of the day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. Good morning.
sound okay? Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, we understand that the events within our nation are difficult at this time. There's a lot of divisiveness. But Lord, what we need is for your people to stand up, preach the truth, give wisdom to our neighbors and our relatives. Wisdom that only comes from you. Lord, we pray that you will work in the heart of Donald Trump and the Senate to select a judge that will exalt righteousness. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, the King of Righteousness. I don't have my hand. Amen. Amen. Fifteen years ago, in 2005, Hurricane Katrina breached the levees and rolled into New Orleans. Less than three weeks later, powerful Rita struck Texas. In October, the strongest ever Atlantic storm, Hurricane Wilma, hit South Florida. In fact, three out of seven most intense Atlantic hurricanes were, that were ever recorded all came within a two-month period in 2005. The first worst, Wilma. The fourth worst, Rita. The seventh worst, Katrina. At the time, warnings were rife that this was the beginning of all of our sorrows. We were going to have massive hurricanes like these battering our coast three, four, five times every year from then on due to what else? Global warming. Of course, they didn't like that term because they found out it's not really accurate. So they changed it to global change. Climate change. Global climate change. But over the next 12 years after 2005, there wasn't a single serious hurricane that hit them. Did that make the news? Did we ever get a retraction from that fear-mongering, garbage science, putrid, liberal, yellow journalism? Of course not. You know what else they failed to report? Nobody reported that they didn't report the 92% decline in global deaths from natural disasters over the last century that peaked in 19, the 1920s, around 5.4 million deaths from natural disasters. No matter reported the 92% decline, in the 2010s, just 400,000 died from such disasters. Even though population quadrupled during that time, so the deaths per capita declined 98%. Last year, most of the Democratic presidential candidates warned that the world would end in 10 years unless we failed to act fast to create a Green New Deal. This Green New Deal would save the planet. In early 2019, newly elected bartender scientist, Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, AOC, she reported the world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. However, Gavin Schmidt, he's a NASA climate scientist, he advised all the time limited frames are bullying. Nothing special happens when the carbon budget runs out or when we pass whatever temperature target you care about. Nothing happens. Of course, he was probably limited in his climatological understanding of the problem since he apparently lacked significant bartending experience or climate Kool Aid consumption. Poor guy. So, listen, when you hear politicians or reporters say, scientists say, what they're really saying is, I don't have the time or the brains. To explain all the details, so I'll just misquote, exaggerate, 
and overly simplify what scientists are saying. Now let's consider this June, June, this June AP article headline, UN, United Nations predicts disaster if global warning not checked. In June. It was one of many summer articles about climate change. In the article, a senior United Nations environmental official claimed that if global warming isn't reversed in 10 years, rising sea levels will wipe out entire nations off the face of the earth, causing an enormous exodus of echo, eco refugees. It warned of melting ice caps, burning rainforests, and unbearable temperatures. They said, we have a 10-year window of opportunity to solve the greenhouse effects before it goes beyond human control, as it really was under human control. 10 years, folks. Did I leave out? Wait, I, I feel to leave out an important item about that article. You see, the UN officials' catastrophic deadline was not in June just three months ago. It was 30 years ago, in 1989. To any intelligent, reasonable, analytical person with only a thimble full of discernment, it should be obvious that these bureaucrats and politicians are high on communist cooling, bent on destroying the American way and the truth of Scripture. Here's what Genesis 8.22 says. While the earth remains. Do you see any earth around here today? While the earth remains. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Shall not cease. And make no mistake, this present earth is not the future home of mankind. Pastor John MacArthur once said, step on the grass, shoot the deer. Drill for oil now. We live on a disposable planet. And if you get upset about that, just wait until you see what the Lord is going to do to it later. Every time you hear about the threat of global warming, just ask yourself the question, have you ever seen a rainbow? God has promised to never destroy the earth with a flood. Global warming will never melt the polar ice caps and destroy the earth. Look, Christ doesn't really want to heal the creation. He cursed it. Our ability to minimize global warming is right on par with our ability to find life on other planets. Legitimate science does not see man as the primary cause of global warming. Instead, it sees a correlation between sunspots and climate change. Global warming is not produced by man. It's produced by the sun in cycles that we don't understand and will probably never understand. And furthermore, the earth is not our mother. This isn't our mother earth. This is our father's world. And, beloved, we need not be obsessed with this future and be fearful of it, like the lost people that dominate our existence. We have other priorities, and we already have an understanding of its future. Now, with regard to this disposable planet, Pastor John MacArthur also said, if you get upset, remember, remember what the Lord's going to do. Well, let's find out what he, what he means by that. 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Nevertheless, we, we, according to his promise, we look for new heavens, and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. And I might also add, truth dwells. Sounds like a disposable planet to me. Beloved, please don't get all wrapped up in endeavors that are designed to steal your focus 
from living for God's glory. Climate change is real because it is part of the cyclical nature within the ebb and flow of his creation. It is part of how temperature fluctuations are averaged over time and over the globe. There is absolutely nothing that mankind can do to stop it, or should we? The intent of the 1990s Green Movement is the same as the Communist Russians for the entire 20th century. It's this, beloved, destroy Western civilization and the capitalism that built it by convincing us that God is not in control, God is not sovereign, and God doesn't have a plan that he is able to complete. But what does God say? He will probably get the last laugh. We need to join in that laugh, by the way. Genesis 1.26, speaking of man, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This verse tells mankind that he, has, that he has dominion over the entire earth. And that means that mankind has ultimate rule over all the earth and its inhabitants. He is also told to subdue the earth. That means he is to configure the earth and its inhabitants to serve mankind. To force the earth and its inhabitants to provide service to the needs and desires of mankind. Now, of course, we are to be good stewards of everything that God provides for us. We are also to be aware that ultimately it is God who preserves this world for us to live in, not us. Here's what Nehemiah 9, 6 says. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. But 12 years ago when I came to Christmas, I was given an opportunity to preach. It was my very first sermon here. Because it was an election year, I based the sermon on Proverbs 14.34 to remind us of our priorities. Today's message will revisit that and see how well party platforms have progressed over these last 12 years. So, again, Proverbs 14.34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I'll say that again. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The question is, therefore, is this. Who determines what sin is? Who determines what brand of righteousness must be displayed by the people? Should we count on our public schools and colleges? Count on our scientists? Count on our government? No. None of these possess the vital information that's needed to secure righteousness in a nation. Only the church of the Lord Jesus Christ possesses the inspired document and possesses the Holy Spirit of truth and the Holy Spirit of illumination. Surely you know there's no greater threat facing our culture than that of the removal of biblical doctrine from our churches. It is biblical doctrine that informs us how we are to approach social protocol, science, medicine, and yes, politics. 2 Timothy 4.3 For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. I, I can tell you one fable. Blind. Global climate change is caused by mankind. Global climate change can be affected and altered by mankind. There's a fable for you. Look, the implication is that doctrine will be regarded as rather burdensome. Something that people of the future... Jesus, they don't want to endure this thing. And I hope you realize the people of the future that Paul wrote about includes us. It's our culture. Beloved, you know the worship that God desired from the Israelites stands in stark contrast to the religions of the heathens. Rather than giving them images, Moses spoke the words of God to them, and then he wrote the words 
in a book. He told them that making images representing God was forbidden. And why do you think that is? It's because no image that man could ever draw and engrave, paint, sculpt, or conjure, or conjure up in his mind would ever truly represent Jehovah God. He is an infinite, invisible spirit. Even the God-prescribed places of worship were drastically different from the pagan counterparts. The Holy of Holies within the tabernacle and within the temple contained not the image of God, but the Word of God contained within the Ark as the Ten Commandments. Again, by God's design, the emphasis is on His Word. Your view of God's Word affects how you interpret it. If you don't believe it is a document given to us by God to inform us how to think and literally live, then you will not see it as binding. Jesus thought it was important. Can I drop this name? He said this, Matthew 4, 4. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now listen, some naive individuals believe that faith and politics don't mix, and therefore servants should avoid this topic. But beloved, faith is supposed to inform your politics. There is absolutely no place in, on, and under, and above the earth where the Word of God is not the supreme authority. And furthermore, God's Word is essential if we're to understand who God is and who we are and why we're here and what we should be doing while we're here. And this discussion is not really about political policy. It's about righteous, biblical policy. Now, when we don't use God's Word to inform our thinking in every single endeavor of our existence, the following foolish ideas become part of our worldview. Let's list them. Geology will begin to say the universe is billions of years old. Astronomy will spend time and resources looking for inhabitants of other worlds, aliens from outer space. Medicine will legitimize abortion. Psychiatry will legitimize aberrant, perverted behavior and try to convince us that someone or something else made us do it. Sociology learns from evolution that some ethnic groups are subhuman, producing racism, slavery, genocides, such as the Holocaust. That kind of sociology says that it takes a village to raise a child. Instead of a man to lead a family, in which a female nurtures the children. Here's another foolish idea that comes part of the worldview. Political movements such as socialism and communism, socialism, socialism. You know what socialism really is? It's a euphemism. That means it's a nice word. It really means communism. You see, we won't swallow the word communism because we've spent decades and countless lives fighting it. It's a godless, useless idea. But we'll swallow socialism because we like to be social. <laughs> socialism is communism! And to be sure, they're not very social. So I'll say it again. Political movements such as communism and socialism become attractive to despots who crave to rule and to undiscerning irresponsible followers who are too lazy to work for their own personal possessions and to prepare a future for their own with their own minds and hands. Those are the kind of things that happen when we don't inform our every single endeavor of our existence with God's Word. Now I doubt if I have to convince anybody here this morning that our country is in the midst of a very divisive election campaign. So which political party deserves your support? Please notice that I didn't ask you which candidate deserves your support. For you to understand the significance of this election, and by the way, every election until the day you die, you will have to be able to rise above the personalities of the candidates. The personalities can sometimes run us the wrong way. 
Sometimes we can be disappointed, by the way, the candidates act. So you have to find out what ideology and what worldview informs their party's platform. Because they're going to do what the party says. Well, to try to answer that question, we'll try to build a biblical base, biblical base concerning the basis upon which we as believers determine who deserves our support in the election. Let's start with Proverbs 16.10. It says this, Divination, divination is on the lips of the king. His mouth must not transgress in judgment. It is an abomination for kings to commit wickedness, for a throne is established by righteousness. Now listen, in this context, I know we don't like the word divination, right? But in this context, divination actually infers, infers no evil, no, no occult connotation as it usually does. This is simply stating that the leader, that as the leader of his people, the king speaks for God. Our leaders, our leaders, whether we like it or not, they speak for God. Therefore, our leaders must be careful that their opinions and their laws and their platform, if you will, agree with those of the Lord. Every leader of every nation that has ever existed will one day give to the Lord an extraordinarily sober accounting of his leadership standards. Every leader is responsible to promote justice and righteousness as defined by God and God alone. No politician can stand behind their own definition of justice, equality, and standard of law. Proverbs 16.9 says this, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Here we see that each man, including our leaders, has a responsibility to think and to plan and to prepare. And yet somehow, through it all and, in, and or in spite of it all, God's sovereign plan is still brought about. That should give us, beloved, a great deal of confidence that God is still in charge even though we may not particularly care for the leadership of our nation. Poor leadership does not constrain the hands of God, nor prevent Him from providing for His children. We don't need to fear the results of any election. Proverbs 16.4 says this, The Lord has made all for Himself, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom, Everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join forces, none will go unpunished. We should not worry if the party that exalts righteousness is not eventually victorious. Don't forget, God uses even the bad choices and the bad decisions of others and of our leaders to somehow bring glory to Himself. We need not worry to come fearful concerning the possible destruction of the Christian culture that the Lord has graciously allowed our country and Western civilization to enjoy. Nevertheless, God will still hold each one of us responsible for the individual decisions and the choices that we make. We may not choose our, our, our government. But we can individually make the right choices. If our country continues on its present course of excluding righteousness and its laws, our personal Christianity will indeed be tested. Today, even Christians appear confused as what makes a subject political and what makes a subject religious. And so they say, does it make, don't talk about it. Let me give an example. Here's some valid subjects. Here's some valid political subjects that involve topics such as how our nation should, well, here's, here they are, here's some political ones, defeat terrorism and strengthen homeland security. That, that's not a moral subject, that's not a religious subject, it's strictly secular. How about this, promote democracy and peace and security and a strong military, achieve energy independence and protect our environment, create good jobs and a strong growth economy, Reform health care and improve education. Make certain that all responsible, lawful citizens have equal rights. Now, concerning these political topics, there certainly are valid differences of opinion. 
about how these issues can be addressed. And both sides of these issues can fall within the proper bounds of normal, orthodox Christianity. There's no conflict between the two arenas of, of politics and biblical authority here. But anytime there is a conflict between political and biblical authority, the church must not be silent. She must point out the gross error of any political party or movement or movement that supports unrighteousness. The church has a responsibility. And we especially have one when it's at the national level where a party platform blatantly defies the righteous standards of Almighty God. That's 12 years ago. I gave my first sermon at the church on this very topic because the 2008 elections were at hand. And at that time, I gave a summary of the biblical doctrines that separated two political parties. Let's see if anything has improved over those last 12 years. Perhaps due, I mean, it could, it could improve, you know, perhaps due to, no doubt, to the widespread audience who heard my message. And the popular reception it enjoyed all across America. So perhaps the Democratic Party has listened and reflected and repented and then changed their message. After all, they, they touted themselves as the party, the party of change in that 2008 election. They did. But first, we're going to go back to 2004. Why? Well, the reason why is because when the survey was given back then, the, the Democratic platform had not been given. So we went back to 2004 to say, what did they believe four years earlier? Here it is. The 2004 Democratic platform stated this concerning the right of a woman to kill her unwanted, intrusive, unborn child. Quote, because we believe in the privacy and equality of women, we stand proudly, proudly, for a woman's right to choose, consistent with Roe versus Wade. We stand firmly against Republican efforts to undermine that right. Abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. Rare. The Democrat platform adopted only four years later said this. Four years later, the Democratic Party strongly and unequivocally supports Roe versus Wade and a woman's right to choose a safe and legal abortion. So, so what changed? Gone is the effort to make the killing of defenseless unborn babies a rare event. Doesn't need to be rare anymore, folks. Well, how about the 2020 Democratic platform? <laughs> no change at all. Beloved, would it be too much to state that we should not vote for candidates whose political party at the city, county, state, federal level promotes the killing of innocent, defenseless babies? Well, what else did they not listen to me about? Well, how about homosexuality? Well, the 2004 Democratic platform stated this concerning the promotion. And beloved, not, we're not talking about equal rights and not in, in, you know, uh, persecuting people. We just we're talking about promotion. The 2004 Democratic platform stated this concerning the promotion of homosexuality and the coercion of any and all employers to our such. Here it is. We will enact the bipartisan legislation barring workplace discrimination based on sexual orientation. We support full inclusion of gay and lesbian families in the life of our nation and seek equal responsibilities, equal benefits, and equal protections for these families. The 2008 platform expressed the same idea. However, the 2020 platform adds the promotion of a new aberrant and immoral ideology. Let's read it. They say they want to guarantee 
transgender students access to facilities based on their gender identity and ban, they want to ban harmful conversion therapy practices. You know, things like tell what the Bible says. They say, we will ensure that all transgender and non-binary people, those non-binary means people are confused, they don't know this male female, we will ensure that all transgender and non-binary people can procure official government identification documents that accurately reflect their gender identity. Democrats will provide coverage of all medically necessary care for gender transition. We will also take action to guarantee full access to needed health care and resources, including gender confirmation, surgery, and hormone therapy. That's 24. Now, in that sermon we preached 12 years ago, I made this prediction. I wrote, I said, you know, beloved, do you know what is coming next if the present political trends are not altered? It's the presence of transgender, sexually confused people in your employ because you are required by law to hire them. You will be required to hire men who think they are women and women who think they are men. You will be required to hire homosexuals to teach in your churches and seminaries. Now it sounded far-fetched to some people back then. But is there anyone here today who would deny this wretched trend? I don't think so. I've got a question for you. Is God the author of confusion? And here's what he said, Genesis 1.27. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created, I'm sorry. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. How clear is that verse? Looks like just two genders. Well, let's see what popular Facebook and the authors of ABC News have to say. In February 2014, Facebook introduced dozens of options for users to identify their gender, and although the social media giant said it would not be releasing a comprehensive list, ABC News has found at least 58 so far. Stay tuned, there'll be more. Well, the please take note that the abortion clinic personnel and homosexuals and transgenders are not our enemies. They're the mission field. Jesus died for them too. Please note that if the Democrat platform has its way, you will not be allowed by force of law to try to tell them what God says about the truth of their gender and the truth of their sexual perversion, and you will go to jail or be fined. That's what says in their platform. They're going to force that. They're the mission field. Jesus Christ died for them too. They are to be evangelized with compassion. 1 Corinthians 6 9 says this Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, and those are male prostitutes, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, and those are homosexuals, nor thieves nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, me. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. See what I mean? It says, and such were some of you. The people on that list are not the enemy. They're the mission field or else how would any of us ever gotten saved? But make no mistake, the political and religious leaders of our country who gladly remove the moral foundation from our country, which is God's word, they're going to receive from him dire consequences when they stand one day before him. And please note also that all those sinners are to be compassionately evangelized. They do not belong in the church if they remain unrepentant. Open sin brings the great brings great division within the church. Because it divides the church 
from its ultimate purpose of glorifying God through holy living. Titus 3.10 says, Reject the device of man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self condemned Now, I would also maintain the same should be practiced by Christian families composed of grown children. Children who are adults should be held accountable by their relatives. It is not loving to tolerate open sin in the church or in the family. Open sin should be confronted lovingly and repentance should be expected or there must be consequences. This form of discipline is most unpopular today because there's this warped liberal attitude that says we, we should just love a sinner to Jesus. Just love him to Jesus. As if that's God's plan of salvation. But beloved, it is not. God already showed us his love by killing his son to pay for our sin. Beloved, please uphold righteousness and reject sin by placing your support for a platform that exalts a righteousness and a justice that is defined not by the fleeting, unreliable fancies and foolishness of worldly politicians, but by that which is defined by an unchanging God of truth. Again, Proverbs 14.34, Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people Look, I, I, I get it. I get it. Look, a lot of people don't like the current Republican Party's choice for president because he can be abrasive and undiplomatic when dealing with people, with his, with, with dealing with his opponents. But let me tell you, beloved, your and my personal choices about, about how presidential dialogue should be conducted is not the basis by which we choose the political party to lead this country. For me and for you to obsess over our personal preference about another person's form of discourse, as long as it does remain within the bounds of lawful civility, for us to obsess over that is an act of outright selfishness on my part. Our focus should go beyond our preferences we must realize that it is the future of our children and our grandchildren that is at stake here. Most very likely, the next president will be able to install one or even two Supreme Court justices. Depending on who is elected, those elections will either guarantee, listen to me, depending on who is elected, those elections will either guarantee that the next 30 to 40 years of American jurisprudence, of constitutional interpretation, will remain conservative and tend to preserve what as little is left of our Christian worldview in this country, or this country will descend as it did in the eight years of the last Democrat platform. It will descend into an ever-widening abyss of moral depravity and godlessness. That descent results from a never-ending promotion of personal irresponsibility. That descent into moral depravity insists that only a bigger and bigger and more intrusive and dictatorial government is able to solve your problems. We eventually become eternal slaves to the government's handout plantation because we are simply helpless to solve helpless, helpless and unwilling to solve our own problems. The godless worldview of people like AOC and her squad will be promoted and extolled with demonic fervor. The America that billions around this world have sought to immigrate to, or in the very least would like to emulate, will be gone forever. Don't be a single issue voter unless that single issue is God's righteousness. Now let me tell you something. The Democratic Party actually knows the truth 
about Jesus Christ. Make no mistake. Many, many of their leaders are Catholic or were raised as Catholics. But I want you to know, here is the result of knowing about Christ and then not responding in obedience. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. What does remain? What remains is a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And then Jesus said this, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness. Now, beloved, if any of you continue to struggle as to what to do with regard to this election, consider the words of our closing hymn. Change my heart of God.
ways that we can't even fathom. Lord, I thank you for the message this morning. Lord, uh, you ordain government. And politics are the thoughts and ideas of government. And so, Lord, I pray that the church would not be timid in the, in the area of this significant subject in our life of government and politics. Lord, I pray for discernment in the body of Christ in America. Lord, for our country uh, and, and the Christian worldview is at stake in our country with our votes. Lord, I pray that you would grant the body of Christ wisdom. Lord, we ask of you grace and mercy. Lord, your word says you are rich in mercy. You have mercy that abounds and is overflowing and you've got extra to give. And Lord, we are asking this Sunday morning in the name of your Son for mercy on our country. We do not deserve your grace. We do not deserve your kindness. We do not deserve revival. But Lord, may the remnant call out this morning in every church around our Lord, around our land, for mercy. That's what we ask from you. We deserve nothing else. We pray for repentance. Lord, we pray for our enemies. Lord, we pray for, for those who do hate our country. We pray for those who do hate you. We do pray for those who, who kill unborn children and make moves for that. Lord, for those who prefer marriage and what you have created. Lord, we pray for these people. Lord, we pray that you would grant them repentance. We pray for salvation. We pray that the name of the Son of God and his work on the cross and his resurrection power would be exalted in our land. And if it's not your will for our country, Lord, that's my prayer for our families here today. It may not be true for our country abroad, but I pray that it would be true for those who are here today. And I'm thankful for these members of this church who are willing to listen to a sermon like they heard today and come back. I'm thankful for Pastor Ken, leader, and, and, and Pastor Ken, leaders of this church who are glad to have someone give a message like this this morning. We thank you for men of God like this. We love you. We thank you for the grace through your son, Jesus Christ. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.